Welcome to those listening in. My name is Kelly Gilbo. I'm one of the two outreach coordinators for the Savannah Institute. Um, and before we get started, I just want to say a little bit about our, our organization. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization focused on research and education about agroforestry. And what that means is working with tre trees that produce crops, which help make farms more profitable, resilient, and healing for the environment. Um, this looks a lot of different ways depending on the farm and their goals. A lot of what we do is in cooperation with farmers. We connect farmers and scientists at universities and other organizations. We collaborate a lot with other, other folks interested in these same things. Uh, we have a lot of events currently coming up. Um, definitely keep on your radar our perennial farm gathering that's going to be happening at the end of the year. Uh, we just sent out a save the date for that. Uh, and also on our website, there are tons of educational resources uh, that are free for download. Uh, so check out savannahinstitute.org. Uh, I'd also like to thank our sponsors for this nutshell series, the Hegner Family Foundation and North Central Stair. So with their support, all of the, these great discussions are for free. Uh, so uh, just a housekeeping thing. Uh, so. We'll, we'll have our, our uh, general presentation here, and then during the, the chat, you're welcome to use the chat box on this feature. There's a little bubble uh, to the right of the, the pop-up screen with the software here uh, that you're welcome to type in any questions you have throughout the presentation, uh, and then we can address those at the end in our Q&A session. So feel free to use that box there. And as I mentioned, at the end, we will have our Q&A session, so you're welcome at that point to, we'll turn on the mics and we can have discussions or questions back and forth. Um, so I'll walk you through that process when we get to that point. Uh, so without further ado, we are honored to welcome our presenter for the evening, Bill Davison. Bill is a local food system educator for University of Illinois Extension. With his academic background in wildlife biology and eight years as a diverse small-scale organic farmer, Bill continually looks for ways to apply his insights into biology, ecology, and agriculture to drive change in the local food systems in Illinois. Bill understands that public health concerns, the uncertain economy, and changing climate patterns demand a significant change in specifically how the nation produces food and he believes that Illinois could be ground zero for this transformation. So towards that end, Bill has founded the Grand Prairie Grain Guild to help farmers transition to organic food grade grains. He's worked with local governments to plant food refuge forest, which is a one acre planting of organic fruits and nuts free for public consumption and enjoyment. And if, that, if that's not enough, Bill's also the founding member of the Artisan Grain Collective, Regenerate Illinois, and the Idea For Farm Network. There's much more to his bio, but I'll let him uh, take it from there. So with that, Bill, I'm going to make you the presenter here. OK, thank you, Kelly. Um, can you see my slide okay. here? It looks good to go. OK. Um, well, welcome everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about the Refuge Food Forest. Um, it's a project I started four years ago, and this is a partnership between University of Illinois Extension and the town of Normal. Um, we're in Bloomington Normal, about three hours south of Chicago. And so I'm going to give an overview of the project and then talk about um, a little bit about what we're doing now and how it relates to agroforestry in Illinois and the, the Midwest. So the image you see here is um, looking into the food forest. You can see we have some mature trees on site. Those are bald cypress trees um, that have been there a long time. And um, this site is the was uh, an orphanage for over 100 years. Um, and this is a picture from, we think, the 1950s or 60s of kids in a garden on the site. So it has a long history of uh, growing food for people. So this is an aerial view of the site, covering a little more than an acre embedded um, within the city park in Normal. Um, 
So when I started this project, I went to the town and proposed it thinking that they would not go for it because like many Midwestern communities, we're a pretty tidy community. So what I was proposing is a little messy, although not not really. But I didn't think they would want to deal with this because it's a novel thing to do. But they got excited about the idea and they contributed about half of the funding, around $8,000. And then extension covered the other half, um, which was mostly plants and, and labor to get it started. And they've been very supportive um, over the past four years. So <clears throat> you can see two mulch piles in this image. Um, so the town delivers mulch that they get from chipping up limbs that they pick up on the streets. And they mow the grass um, between all the, the beds that you see here and um, are just generally supportive with developing infrastructure on the site, that sort of thing. And then I use volunteers that we have through extension and that I recruit um, as part of this project to do the management. And I'll show some pictures of that later. The long-term goal um, for this project is to um, get kids outside. And so this was my thinking. This is my oldest son. And so the idea is we wanted to get little kids outside picking berries and um, thinking that that would carry through for their whole life and turn them into informed consumers that would support local food systems. So that's one of our long-term goals. And I have a few images here showing how, how we started. We basically um, marked the beds and tilled up the soil. You can see here we have beautiful soil. It's about four to six feet deep. So our plants have done really well. This is what it looked like, We're all prepped and ready to go. And then uh, this is Kevin Walls, who works with the Savannah Institute. So we worked with him and uh, his team of people. Um, he had a, a company where he traveled around the Midwest and established agroforestry plantings on farms. And a lot of what we have done is based on um, research that he did for his PhD. So he's marking, like color coding the locations for all the different plants because we had uh, 75 volunteers come out for a day to plant. So we were coordinating a big group of people and trying to get all the plants in the ground. And this is what we ended up doing. So we did put landscape fabric down. It's not my preference, but you know we wanted to do it um, to make sure we could keep up with the weeds, which even with the fabric, it's still a challenge. But it definitely makes it easier. So we use organic practices on this site. So we lay landscape fabric and we cover it with wood chips, which is what you see happening here. And then we plant the little strip in between. And on our planting day, we um, had a bunch of kiddie pools and bare root plants with uh, agrogel in them, the little, uh, little beads that stick to the roots and help keep them moist. So that's what they're doing here, dumping water in, getting everything wet. And then we had a big group that day. So you see people here are digging trenches for asparagus. It's amazing what you can do when you've got 75 people working. Um, so we planted the whole site in one day. We had augers going and, and volunteers planting. Um, we put 2,500 plants in. Had little kids out there helping us out. We planted this willow border um, mostly to provide a physical uh, structure to the planting. And they're about 30 feet tall now. Pretty impressive. And they're easy to handle and grow. All you do is take these cuttings and stick them in the ground, which is what you see in the picture there. And this is what it looked like when we were done. So we got we got all the little bare root plants in the ground, mulched them, and um, they started to leaf out, which is what you see here. And then it just uh, took off from there. We did put in a prairie. Uh, we we use plugs from that, so Kevin's team grew out prey plants, and we transplanted the plugs, and this is what it looks like now. 
And we did this um, in an effort to maintain um, balance and then um, beneficial insects on the property. So if you go up to the prairie and look, this is what you tend to see. Little wasps, honeybees, really big wasps, um, other colorful insects, some of which are, are predators of pests that you might have in a food forest setting. Um, and then we have some infrastructure that the park staff helped us with. We built an arbor um, to grow seedless grapes on. And this is what it looks like today. So I was, I had some reservations about um, growing grapes on the arbor, but we decided to try it. And we've had some setbacks, mainly in the form of Japanese beetles, which are one of our biggest problems. Um, they set them back every year, so they haven't grown as quickly as we'd like. And I'm thinking about other other vining crops like hardy kiwi, things like that, that we might um, put in around the grapes to see how they do. Uh, we have a message center, which you see here. So we put our brochures in the bottom, and then we have a map and other information inside that display. And then we have this little shed built on the right, which is really handy because we keep all of our wheelbarrows and hand tools in there. Before before the shed, we were transporting them for every workday. But most of our workdays look, look like this. So we get out the wheelbarrows and we spread wood chip mulch. We've probably gone through about 20 dump truck loads of mulch. Um, this is the primary way that we're managing the soil, um, increasing fertility, and suppressing weeds. So these are college students. So we have college students out. We also get groups of Boy Scouts and other younger kids out. And this is a nice team building exercise for them, handling the wheelbarrows and moving the mulch. And one of the reasons that we use mulch is we want to promote um, fungi in the soil. Uh, and that's what you see here. It's just the underside of a piece of wood that we turned over, which had, had a nice pattern of the growth of fungal roots or hyphae, which grow in the soil. And this is really important because these can connect with the roots of the plants and um, deliver nutrients to the plants and just generally um, make the system healthy. So that's one of the benefits of using a lot of wood chips. And then now, four years in, one of the main jobs that we do is pruning. So that's what you can see here. These are Chester thornless blackberries, which are super vigorous. So I have to prune these about three or four times a year. Um, they, they just grow and are a lot and are super productive. So this is what it looked like last year. You can see there are two peach trees in the foreground at the end of the beds. Um, and then those are currants and black raspberries. And you see the wood chip mulch and the little corners of the landscape fabric showing underneath. And this is what that same area looks like this year. So peach trees grow really fast. Um, and the black raspberries are kind of like the blackberries, super vigorous. So we have to prune them a lot. This is what it looks like now. They're almost, they almost grow together. So we, we go through and prune them. So rather than try to use a trellis, the approach that we take is to prune them back, keep them kind of short, and then they develop stout canes that are mostly upright so we don't we don't provide any trellis support we just prune them back in terms of the mix of fruits um, that we have out there I'm, I'm going to show some images um, of the fruit so we have lots of apples which I, I kind of question growing apples um, in particular so we have quite a few varieties, but mostly what we have are a relatively short list of the most disease and insect resistant varieties. But none of them are resistant to Japanese beetles, so they all get damaged by Japanese beetles, um, June beetles. And on top of that, apple, for us here in central Illinois, apples are just hard to grow organically. It, it takes a lot of effort, and so we most likely are going to get mostly um, 
cosmetically challenged apples and I'm not sure how people are going to receive them because they're not used to that. Every, you know, every apple in the store is perfect. Um, so I would, I would encourage you if you're someone who's thinking about starting one or working on one to not go too heavily into apples and, unless you know you can manage them. Um, <laughs> so this is a beautiful cluster of grapes. And this is the vision I had in mind for our arbor, is these clusters of grapes hanging down from the arbor, which we may or may not ever see that, but that was my thinking. Um, the Japanese beetles are making that difficult. And then I worry that even if we do get grapes, if we happen to get a lot of grapes and raccoons find them, then the raccoons get all the grapes. And so they're a challenging crop to grow. What we have the most of are currants, and that's what you see here, red, white, and black currants, and these are a great crop. So I would encourage anyone um, thinking about this to really look into currants. Um, they're upright shrubs. They're easy to grow. They're really easy to propagate. They're super nutritious. They have very few insect and disease problems, and you get to challenge people's palates, which is part of what we wanted to do with this. You know, if you just grow sweet berries, then they're easy to easy to eat, and um, you don't expand people's uh, palates as much. The <laughs> black currants are probably the most challenging fruit we have. They're super tart, astringent, um, but they're also nutritious, and you can use them a lot of different ways. If you add enough sugar to them, then they become palatable. But one thing I've learned, you know, every time I take a group of kids or people out there, I try to encourage them to try the black currants if they're ripe and uh, I we have had little kids just eat them by the handful and say they love them and so that's really what we are going for out there that's what we wanted to see happen but sometimes you have to encourage them but little kids often don't know um, that they're not supposed to like this sort of thing and they'll eat it a lot of times it's the parents sort of preconceived ideas that um, you know sugar is appealing that you have to work around. We have persimmons, the orange fruit you see here. Um, they haven't produced yet, but um, we have meter persimmon trees, and um, these will be appreciated if we actually get them. They're super sweet. We have lots of elderberries. It's, this is an easy crop to grow. This has potential for agroforestry on farms. We have some farms around here planting relatively large um, plantings of these. They're very nutritious. We have black raspberries, which you see here. These are probably the favorite um, berry in our planting. They, they get picked daily when they're ready. Um, we had figs for a little while, but they, they died over the winter. They were amazing. So if you happen to be south of where I'm at, you could consider figs or if you're north of here, you have to protect them over the winter somehow. Um, so here we have blackberries, raspberries, service berries, and aronia, all, all part of our planting. All These are all pretty easy to grow and manage. Aronia is really tart and astringent, kind of like the black currants. But something that I'm moving towards now, so over the course of four years, seeing how hard it is to grow apples and pears. Um, and ha we have mulberry trees just popping up like they do, like a weedy plant, all, all over the planting. So I started to let them grow and prune them like fruit trees. And then recently, the Savannah Institute um, shared a publication on mulberries. And I read that and got excited about them. So this coming spring, I'm going to plant all the cultivated all the cultivars um, of mulberries that I can find on the site and try to add them because they have a lot going for them. They're very easy to grow. You don't even have to plant them in many cases. Um, you get annual production of nutritious berries. Um, and another interesting thing about them is they're so perishable that they probably will never be developed as a crop for the industrial food system, which helps create a niche for any farmers or people looking to build local markets. Um, this could be a unique
product. And so we're, we're going to start doing more uh, with mulberries. And we have beds of herbs, which I think a lot of people appreciate for cooking and tea, um, that sort of thing. Th these are flowers on chives, but we have sage, oregano, thyme, garlic chives, and others in a, in a small bed, and people can um, pick those as they like. And I should mention, so this whole planting, it's free, it's open to the public, anyone can come at any time and pick whatever they like. There's no, no restrictions on it. As far as the challenges that we face, um, you see this uh, tree trunk here with a little um, chew marks on it from rabbits. So that would be one of the biggest challenges. Rabbits like to eat the bark off trees. And I was under the impression that I had to protect the trees over the winter and could remove the guards in the spring. But a few years ago, we learned that some rabbits just keep eating the bark through the summer. And so we had to put the cages back on. Um, so that's been a challenge for us. We don't have deer, which I'm very thankful um, that we're in town enough that the de we don't have to deal with deer. So mostly um, it's rabbits that challenge us. And then you see the, the other image um, are Japanese beetles on a chestnut leaf. So they are pretty hard to deal with. I have sprayed um, kaolin clay a few times, which is a fine white powder you can dissolve in water, spray on the leaves, and it forms a physical barrier and an irritant to the insects. And so that can help slow them down. Um, it washes off every time it rains, but um, it is a way to save some plants if they're really um, feeding heavily on them. And for some reason at this site we have a huge quantity of June beetles, like the spotted June beetle, regular June beetle, and they come out at night and feed on the apples and grapes and are pretty hard to deal with. They're a native insect, so it's kind of hard to uh, get mad at them like the Japanese beetles, but I worry about our apple trees in particular. Um, and so again, it's uh, kale and clay is our way to deal with them. Other challenges that we face, so we have um, a rhubarb patch and an asparagus patch. And the rhubarb, we put in bare root, and it just didn't do well. Um, you can kind of see in that picture we didn't get good survival. So we ended up giving up on the rhubarb. And then asparagus, people love it. Um, almost too much. So we managed to, to keep them from being picked for a year or two, but now they get picked really heavily and it's hard to keep the weeds out. And it's right next to our prairie, so the prairie is creeping in. So I think we're going to let it go and it's going to be, it's going to turn into more of a wild asparagus patch because it's going to have prairie plants in it. Um, so people might ask for it, and it might be a popular thing to do, but it's been hard for us to manage the asparagus. So what I'm doing now, now that we're four years in, and we have, you know, our fruit trees are six to 12 feet tall, um, I'm starting to do propagation workshops because we want to work to establish more food forests in our town and region. So this image on the left, is our uh, recent propagation workshop. So that's rootstock in the foreground and cyanwood wood behind it. And then the image on the right just shows what it looks like when you graft a fruit tree. You, you make those cuts in the little notch and you, you stick the two pieces together. And that's the way you propagate um, apples and pears and other fruit trees. So we're teaching people how to graft fruit trees and one of the nice things about this is you can also rescue trees in your community. So this is an old tree that I got cuttings off of, which is barely has any live wood left on it. It's a really old tree. So you can take cuttings from those, um, graft them, and save that, save those genetics from favorite trees. So this is what the grafted trees look like. So I just have a little nursery. Um, bed, uh, you, and uh, you can see the black um, covering on the trunk, so that's where the graft is, and then in the spring, if all goes well, they leaf out, and then the picture on the right is what they look like now. So I get about 90% survival with grafted fruit trees. 
And then we are propagating Chinese chestnuts um, from nuts that we're buying from Route 9 Cooperative in Ohio. So the picture on the left here just shows you a chestnut growing a root and then a seedling um, that's about a month old. And so the biggest challenge with the chestnuts is keeping the squirrels from eating them. Um, they're very persistent about that, so you really have to be careful in either put them in a hoop house or in some protected location or in my case what I did is I covered them with a low tunnel so you can kind of see in the background of that little tree there's there's a row cover fabric over hoops and I just keep them covered they're still covered now because I'm I don't want the squirrels to know they're there but the trees are about three feet tall now and they look really good and then uh, this is a cutting from a current. So with currants and some other shrubs like elderberries, you can just cut a branch and stick it in the ground and water it. And if you have it in a garden setting and you keep it watered, a lot of them will take root. So it's very easy to propagate them in that way. So now um, I want to change gears a little bit and talk about how we're using the food forest the propagation workshops together to promote agroforestry um, in central Illinois. So this image is the Mackinac River watershed. Um, and the very bottom of the image, you can kind of see the interstate. That's, that's booming to normal. So that's where the food forest is located. And so we are working on a project to try and promote uh, crop diversity and get agroforestry established on farms in this watershed. And the areas that are highlighted in red are nature preserves owned by a land trust in town. So we're partnering with them and we're working with um, Iroquois Valley Farmland, which is a, an organization that buys farmland for organic farmers and leases it to them. So we're going, we're working on buying farms around the preserves with the idea that we can buffer the nature preserve and provide a benefit to the farmer in that they're, the land that they're renting is, is buffered um, in some ways. And we're going to try to overcome some barriers and get um, agroforestry plantings established on these farms. So we're looking at, we got some grant funding and that's part of the reason we're propagating all these plants. We need, we know that we need to get plantings out on farms so farmers can see these crops growing and so we're working towards that um, targeting this watershed this particular watershed you could see has tree cover has some rolling land has a concentration of organic farmers in place um, and so we're targeting we're targeting them and then the other thing we're trying to do um, the little red dot that you see just north of the town is the end of our a trail system that we have in town It's called the Constitution Trail um, it's a walking biking trail but it stops right there so we're working on connecting that to the lake that you see um, just north of there it's only about three miles and so we can get people that appreciate the food forest and other people to continue on that trail make it to the lake and then on to the Mackinac River so we have our informed consumers um, connecting with our farmers in that watershed so we also, there's a lot of research being done at University of Illinois um, and the other universities to improve uh, varieties for Chinese chestnuts, hazelnuts, crops like that. So we're hopeful that when we combine modern genetics um, with all the other work that's being done that we'll get, we'll get more of these plantings out on farms. And then the other project, we have uh, what's called a seed library. So if you do happen to start a food forest or um, work on one, this is a nice complement to it. So this is in our public library. Um, it's just a way to share seeds and plants. Uh, it's an old card catalog. Um, and we kind of stocked it with seeds initially. And then people can come and check out seeds and grow them in their garden. And the idea is that you grow them, resave the seed, and, and return some back to the library. And so we use it to share um, 
seeds and also you see there's garlic here but cuttings, root divisions, cyan wood, all, all manner of uh, different ways to propagate plants we share through this seed library and we do public programming there to, to raise awareness around that. And this is just a painting someone gave me. So um, this is here just to show that uh, the food forest has been a really um, satisfying project. It's been very gratifying to work on it. People really appreciate it. Um, I would say for the most part it has gone really well. Uh, I wasn't sure if things would get picked, but we actually have the opposite problem where Things get picked every day, and things get picked before they're fully ripe, <laughs> which is good in a way, but uh, it's it's pretty amazing when there are people out there every day. Um, and I think parents really like it. You know, little we get little kids out there, and they love to run around and pick berries, and they have their favorite berries, and they drag their grandparents around and show them their favorite berries, and so. Um, it's it's a great project and I've I've really enjoyed it. So um, I think now I got through that pretty quickly. So um, if people have questions, I think Kelly can enable um, you to to ask questions or type type questions in the chat box if you'd like. So uh, we've got Bill here uh, has a question. So. Let's see, let me unmic everyone. Okay, both bills should be live. <laughs> both bills. Hi, Bill. And this is Bill Wilson of Midwest Permaculture. Um, Bill, I'm curious, it's, uh, it's wonderful to hear about the, uh, the public support that you're getting or the um, interaction or the participation of the community. Um, that's, that's really wonderful to hear. That's the, the highlight, I think, of the project. Uh, just some real mundane things, though. Um, I'm curious about um, the grafting process that you're using. Have you ever used the Omega grafting tool? And if you have, what kind of success did you have with it? I have not um, used that tool, but I am I am currently looking into buying them because what we've done for the past three years is use grafting knives, um, which are really sharp knives. And every time I do it, somebody cuts them themselves. And so... <laughs> Um, yeah, we. I want to switch to the tool, and I. I'm hoping that we get equivalent or better um, success, but I've I've never used one. So, but, but we're looking at doing it because the last. So in this past spring, I even bought um, cut-proof gloves. You know, culinary type yeah. gloves, which are surprisingly thin, but they have steel. Fat, you know wire in them but someone still cut through the glove and cut their finger <laughs> so grafting wow. can be a little sketchy but yeah I want to switch to the tool and just set it up where we have a few people um, using the tool and just cranking out the rootstock and then other people matching up the sign wood and, and try to run it that way well for what it's worth I've, uh, I've uh, used the tool but I use it to demonstrate what's possible but I haven't had a lot of success with it. I haven't had a lot of grafts taking. So, um, but I haven't done a lot either. I mean, I've only done a, a dozen or two. Maybe I'll probably two or three dozen. Um, so anyway, I'll be curious to see if you have any success with that. It would be nice to know. Um, the other thing is, is the chestnuts. Um, I can understand that the squirrels being a problem with the chestnuts when the chestnuts are coming on. Although I understand as long as they're still in their um, their husk. Um, it's not until they open up that the squirrels are able to really access them. I, I could be wrong on that, but that's my understanding. But are you saying you're having a problem with the squirrels attacking the trees when they're small, but before they even have a nut on them? Oh, yeah. Well, I was talking about um, when we propagate them. So we plant, you plant, we're planting a chestnut that we're mm -hmm. buying from Route 9 Cooperative in Ohio because they have, they have good genetics, diverse genetics and so we're planting the nuts to grow the little trees and you have got to protect that nut or the squirrels will, will get all of them. <laughs> oh I got you so it's when you're actually trying to sprout the nut in order to get the rootstock that um, they're, they're digging out the nuts. Yep. Gotcha. All right. <laughs> even, even if uh, I put chicken wire over them and I thought okay this ought to be good but they'll they will 
pull, they will, when the little sprout comes up, they will pull the nut through the chicken wire and eat it. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I appreciate it, Bill. Thank you very much, and thanks for the work you're doing on that. I look forward to coming down and uh, taking a look at the project. Um, was uh, I was uh, thinking this was actually going to be down there in, in uh, Bloomington, and I was going to come down, but uh, I'll come down some other time if that's all right. Yeah, that'd be great. I'd, I'd be happy to give you a tour. That's great. We've, we've got three um, uh, work trader interns here for a month, and um, I'd love to bring them down so you can show them the success that you're having and, and, uh, and the challenges. So maybe we can work that out. Sure. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Bill, related to that, have you been in touch with other communities or organizations who are looking to do this and sort of share notes? What are similarities and differences? Been, uh, to put in community food for us? Right. Well, so I was directing to Bill Davison. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what if, if you've got entry too? Well, so we have a second one in our community. So one of the workshops we did in the spring, we grafted a few hundred fruit trees and had a bunch of chestnuts and current cuttings, and we got those um, to a community garden. And so they're adding all those perennial plants to their community garden. So we have a second one in town, and then I'm going to do at least two workshops this coming spring trying to recruit people. So we have a lot of um, – and the thing I always tell people is our project is pretty el elaborate. It doesn't have to be like this. You can, uh, you can incorporate these plants into l existing landscaping, you know, especially things like the currents. You can put a single row along a, a walking path. So it doesn't have to be uh, as complex as what we have here. But there's, there seems to be a lot of interest in it. Yeah, I was curious about the particular site that you showed us. Like, what was the area before? And you know, it, when you're suggesting uh, other communities incorporate this, are, is there any rhyme or reason to what a site, what's, what's the best site, what's an appropriate site to even start this? So I recently toured a farm that was planted the same time as our food forest, um, but it had been conventionally farmed for a long time, and it, it appears as if the soil was not tested or amended at all. And so I think some people think that trees, you know, and perennial plants are tougher, and it doesn't matter as much, but... That site did not look good. Um, there was a lot of mortality. So you do need to pay attention to your soil. It doesn't have to be great soil, but ideally um, it'd be well-drained, reasonably fertile, and um, not full of perennial weeds. So you definitely want to try to avoid Canada thistle and bindweed, um, which we have and are just super difficult to deal with. But other than that, um, if you till up the site and, and you use landscape fabric and or wood chips, um, it's it's pretty easy to manage once you get things established. Awesome. Any other questions out there from our audience, folks? Again, you can get in the queue here uh, or type a question into the chat box. You, there was a question from Tim, and then you eventually answered it, actually, but uh, about addressing the Japanese beetles using the clay or uh, Tim suggesting neem oil as well. Have you explored that? I have used neem oil um, at my house. I, I haven't used it at the food forest, <laughs> but we do have, we have a lot of volunteers, and last year they started, they went out and picked them off the plants and put them in soapy water. And I think that makes people feel better, but we have so many beetles that they always seem to be there feeding on the plant. So, yeah, I think I keep hoping that, you know, if we have a cold winter or, or we get some cyclical fluctuation in their numbers that, you know, the plants will get a chance to recover, but they've been pretty consistently bad for us, so I might have to look into doing more, which might include neem oil, and um, there are organically improved um, insecticides, things like that, that you could spray, but um, 
Yeah, we might have to look into that. Yeah, you didn't mention any kind of chemicals or anything. Uh, so uh, how, is that a consideration with so much of the public coming through or, you know, sort of interacting with, with anything you might spray? Yeah, people are, you know, we, we we're committed to being organic. We talk about it as such. So um, when I was spraying the clay, we got a lot of questions in our Facebook group about it um, because people saw me with the sprayer and we said no it's just clay mm. um, yeah. okay let's see so Sven has typed a question here um, just wanting to know more about the workshops uh, that you hold and community engagement um, looks like you know Sven wants to have a conversation more in depth about that <laughs> uh, but perhaps you could um, just say a little bit more about the structure of those workshops, some of the outcomes. Sure, yeah. Um, we do those late March, early April, because that's when we get the rootstock in the mail from Cummins Nursery in New York. Um, so what we do is I collect cyan wood um, over the winter and cuttings from the currants, and then I order chestnut seeds. And I hold all those in the refrigerator over the winter. And then when the rootstock comes in the mail, we, we have our workshop scheduled through extension. And I limit it to 20 people per workshop just for the sake of managing the day. And we basically come together and I introduce, you know, the food forest and, and the little background. But then we pretty much just set about um, grafting fruit trees um, and then they get a bunch of handouts and information on how to care for cuttings and the chestnut seeds and so we just start out with um, pruned little limbs from fruit trees and we have them practice the grafting cut so we have them practice making the flat cut putting the notch in it and we make them graft the limb together and when it looks like everyone's got the hang of it, then we break out the rootstock and sign wood and just uh, have everyone graft as, as many trees as we can. And then we send people home with uh, four fruit trees, ten chestnuts, and um, six or so cuttings from currants. And they pay a fee. They pay somewhere around $25, which covers our cost for that workshop. Awesome. Okay, we've got Arlene in the queue here. Arlene, I'm, your mic should be live. Hi, uh, this is Arlene uh, from Wisconsin. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you have tried or thought of trying to attract birds that might eat some of these bugs. Um, would you have a fountain? Do you, you must have a water source there. Um, do you, do. Have you thought of that? Yeah, we do have water. Um, yeah, we haven't done that. We haven't put up um, birdhouses. We have mature trees around, and we have quite a few birds. But um, I've noticed in my own garden that I have a lot of birdhouses, and that does seem to, to help to have a lot of small birds around. So, yeah, that's something we might look into. Yeah. Also, uh, you might... I have noticed that in our garden here, uh, out in rural Wisconsin, um, that uh, we have a fenced area to keep the rabbits out, and hopefully, <laughs> and uh, the birds perch on the fence, and they seem to go after the grubs and stuff too, you know. So yeah. Uh, worth, worth a try, you know. Yeah, the trouble is to observe and see what happens, you know, and and you're not there all the time so it's that's difficult yeah I don't often see rabbits there but I know I know there there's a lot of them around and they they did quite a bit of damage before we got all the trees protected again uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> okay okay thanks Arlene and so sure. similar um, Tim typed another question uh, just more about water and it, maybe miss something about uh, irrigation or, you know, do you strip lines or volunteers to actually water all these plants? <laughs> so we, we don't use any drip lines and we actually haven't watered much. We've been pretty fortunate um, to get rainfall 
when we needed it. We did water a little bit the first year um, to get things established, but we just used hoses and, and buckets because we had a lot of people and uh, we didn't want we didn't want um, drip lines running around the site. So we've gotten by with that and now we have so many wood chips on the ground that the the whole planting is pretty well buffered from dry spells. So it, it hasn't been a big issue for us. Okay. Great. Well, any other questions from the audience? You mentioned a few things that you do differently if you start it over or whatever. What what are some of that come to mind? Um, fewer apple trees, uh, more pear trees. I wish I had started uh, with mulberries, more mulberries, and generally um, more of a focus on what is easy to grow and not necessarily what we think people expect because. Um, I think the apples are just always going to be a, a, a challenge for us and you know we're going to be producing apples with blemishes and it's um, I just don't know how many people are going to be willing to do the prune or the um, trimming the extra work involved in eating an apple like that. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you are tracking somehow who comes daily to pick some of the fruits or so yeah that's been a challenge for us we are working with that now um, I have a comment anonymous comment box up with a big sign so we're getting a little bit of feedback that way we also want to put out a guest book like a sign-in sheet and try to get people to sign in because we know that a lot of people are visiting the site we go through hundreds of brochures every couple weeks and I see a lot of people out there the problem is they enter from all sides in a diffuse pattern. Um, so it's going to be hard to get everybody, but yeah, we are trying to, to capture that. We do know how much, I do track the fruit produced, so we know, you know we're producing thousands of pounds of berries every year. Would you say that, does any of that go to waste, or is it all picked? Do you donate any of the excess? Um, most of it gets picked, especially the black raspberries, raspberries, blackberries, those type of berries. Some of the black currants end up dropping on the ground, and so we don't get all the currants. Um, I'm not sure what's going to happen with the tree fruit, you know, when we start to get apples and pears. Mm -hmm. But up to this point, it's all it's all been picked. If we do have if we do have a big surplus, we have some ideas about groups to work with to get it um, picked up and and out to people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like you've got a whole slew of volunteers and the communities engaged really has bought into this. Uh, and so in the chat box, we've just shared the Facebook link. Um, is it is it correct that this is a group? Um, Facebook.com slash group slash food forest. Is that still the correct link for the Facebook? It is, yep. And it's a closed group, so um, it's all, all the posts are about the food forest. There's no external posts. It's mostly me posting. And then some, we have 500 some members and um, there are some posts from the members about what they picked and um, how they're using the fruit, that type of thing. Very cool. And so if folks outside of the community that are listening to this want to join, is that appropriate for them to join? Sure. Yep. Everybody is welcome. We'd like to have more people participate. Awesome. Well, let's see. Any other any other questions? Um, that's all really great information. Uh, Bill, anything on your end? Any kind of specifics or logistics that that weren't addressed? I just wanted to say I'm happy to give tours. So I I know there was a question um, before this, like people said they wanted to come and see the site. So they they can email me 
and I'd be happy to try to coordinate with them and give them a tour. Awesome. That's wonderful. Well, great. Uh, well, if there are no other questions, any final words, Bill, before we wrap up? Um, no, just kind of what I said before. This is a great project. I really enjoy it. I'm glad I started it. So if anyone's thinking about it, I, I definitely recommend it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story, your expertise. It sounds like a lot of people are, are going to take it and run with it in their own communities. Uh, so that's all we've got. I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thanks again for joining, and we'll see you next nutshell. Mm -hmm.